Hello and welcome to the Sex Within Marriage podcast. My name is JD and I blog over at uncoveringintimacy.com. And today we're going to be talking about reframing duties and obligations in marriage. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started up a new cohort in our Becoming More Sexually Engaged course for Christian Wives, and it created a lot of discussion around uh, rights, duties, obligations, what we owe our spouses when it comes to sex as we start the course by talking about what the Bible says about sex. And of course, uh, the verse 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 comes up, you know, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And of course, the verse before it, uh, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his body, but the wife does. And this, of course, makes many people uncomfortable because this appears to be talking about the removal of autonomy, of taking away your right to say no, especially when I challenge the idea of having veto power in the marriage regarding sex. And then I pile that on with the first challenge of the course, you know, stop saying no. And this led one wife in the course to rightly question, sex should be a gift given freely. And if I don't have veto power, am I really giving free freely? And you can read all that and think, well, this is just about women making women sex slaves in their marriages. And it's true that some people have used these verses to support just that idea. But I think they miss an important piece. That giving up of control is supposed to be a self-sacrificing gift. It should not be forced or coerced. Uh, the these verses speak of an ideal where each spouse dies to self and then gives up their autonomy together and hands it off to each other. Uh, I use the example often that my wife and I used to fight for our own rights in marriage. She would fight for the right to sleep and I would fight to f for the right to have sex. And this is an argument you frankly can't win. This is when couples fall into compromises, uh, keeping score, trading favors, whatever you want to call it. Uh, basically, if I win, then she loses. If she wins, then I lose. And so we compromise and decide on a number of times where we both lose. So it's not so bad to, that either of us is really upset about it. And it, it's a terrible way to navigate a marriage. These days, we try to fight for each other's needs while being honest about our own. I often say something like, you seem really tired. Why don't we get to sleep earlier tonight and we'll see how you're feeling tomorrow? And she'll counter with, but it's been a while and I know you must be feeling antsy. And again, I'll counter with, I'm doing okay today. We can sleep tonight. Or if I'm not handling it as well, maybe suggest a quickie and something more substantial on the weekend. You know, we talk about where we're at and what we can offer rather than fight for our wants, expecting the other to fight for theirs. And so my wife doesn't say no. Uh, we have a conversation and then we decide together. And honestly, sometimes I decide for her that we're going to go to sleep instead of having sex because I can tell she really wants to offer sex, but also that she's exhausted. And I, I think this is how those verses are supposed to be lived out. My wife's be body belongs to me, and so I take care of it as if it was my own. Uh, when she's tired, I fight to get it sleep. Uh, my body belongs to my wife, and so she takes care of it as if it was hers. When I'm feeling a need of sex, she tries to meet that need. And sometimes we end up kind of in a conflict because we're desperately trying to meet the needs of the other instead of our own. And that's a conflict you can't lose. You know, if she wins, then... I get my needs met. And if I win, then she does. And it's, it's a win-win situation and we both feel loved in the process. That's not to say that we're perfect. You know, I can still get frustrated when it's been a while, but it's not directed at my wife. I'm frustrated with the circumstances that led to the delay. Uh, I can't be mad at her because I'm trying to protect her through those circumstances and meet her needs as well. And sometimes she still feels guilty because she feels like she's not meeting my needs during those situations. But since I'm fighting for her to get sleep, I think and I hope that that guilt is somewhat abated because it's also my decision that we're waiting. Well, what if it's less than ideal? You know, what if your spouse doesn't fight for your rights? That's when uh, Proverbs 25, verse 21 and 22 comes to mind. You know, if your enemy is hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their head and the Lord will reward you. If this is how we are to treat our enemies, then how should we treat our spouses? 
no less, I think. Uh, we do what is right because we love them, not because they will necessarily do the same for us. If they do, well, that makes an amazing marriage. But if they choose not to, then you can still do the right thing because that's what you vowed to do. And I see this as a parallel for what Christ did for us. He gave up his veto power, his everything power for us. He gave up infinite cosmic power and chose to make himself a useless, tiny infant dependent for everything. And then he grew up. And when he was at peak human power, thousands of people following him, disciples who would fight at the drop of a hat for him, he chose to give up his life and let us kill him instead. Not because we would do anything for him. In fact, the vast majority of people he died for would never acknowledge that sacrifice. Most don't even believe it happens. So he didn't do it for recognition or to get his needs met or to save his life or for anything other than simply because he loved us and it was the right thing to do. And you might say, well, that's not fair. He was God. And that's true. But look at his life. He lived it as an example for us. He never used his godness, for lack of a better word. Uh, he asked his father for power the same as we can, and it was granted the same as God can for us. But Jesus never once took that power upon himself as God. That would have been cheating and a useless example for us. And the most amazing thing about it is true for us as well. At any time, he could have picked that power back up. He never truly gave up his agency, and we don't either. That's the most amazing part of a long, loving marriage, is not that they become slaves, but rather that every day they choose to live for each other. Christ, every day, every hour, every moment, chose to leave that power to the side and not use it. And you might say, well, he was sinless. He didn't have a sinful nature. And that's also true. However, he was sinless because he chose not to sin. Adam and Eve didn't have a sinful nature. They still sinned. So did Lucifer and a third of the angels in heaven. They still sinned. Those are not excuses. Uh, what Jesus did was perfect without any cause for him to be perfect other than that it was what was required to love us. That is our example. Now, personally, I'm not as strong as Jesus was. I can't imagine the willpower needed to go through what he did. And I know most of you reading this aren't either. I'm not expecting you to be for perfect. Nobody is. You know, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And sometimes we do need to give our spouses opportunities to love because they aren't perfect either. We can't expect them to know what they can do to show us to love us innately. Uh, if you start with the assumption that they love you and want to show you that, then it's actually loving to sit them down and say, hey, I'm not feeling loved. This is how you can love me. And that way they can know how to show you love instead of guessing and maybe getting it wrong. I know there's a lot of what if scenarios out there, you know, you're welcome to post them in the comments on the blog post and we can hash them out. But I hope this gives a bit of a framework for how to view duties, obligations and responsibilities in marriage, not worrying about giving up autonomy and agency, but rather aiming to love each other perfectly, uh, knowing that we're going to fail, but having a model to follow in Christ. And that's all I wanted to say today, because this is what I've been thinking about. I hope that's helped somebody out there. And if you have questions or arguments or anything, head over to the blog post, go down to the comment section. You can write anything in there. As long as you are respectful and trying to actually have a conversation, I will let anything go. And that's it for today. Talk to you next time.